Hello, welcome back to part two of our introduction to discrete event systems modeling using Petrinets. In part one, we looked at a definition of discrete event systems. We also looked at an example discrete event system and modeled it using a finite state uh, machine formalism. In this part, we will be discussing uh, Petrinets uh, and we will model the same example using Petrinets. So let's uh, begin our introduction to Petrinets. A Petrinet gives a graph theoretic representation of the processes, communications, and control patterns in discrete event systems. Needless to say that Petrinets uh, provide us with the language, a formalism to model discrete event systems. So uh, we use it to model discrete event systems. They capture the precedence relations and structural interactions of concurrent and asynchronous events. The graphical nature of petri nets allow us to visualize the complexity of the system. So models done in petri nets will be drawn as graphs and that graph structure will help us uh, capture the, the complexity of the system. The petri nets are not just graphs that we draw, they are also executable, so we will be able to simulate, execute those uh, graphs. And on top of all that, um, they also provide a mathematical framework for analysis and verification um, of certain properties that we may be interested in uh, looking for in a, in a model of a system. Technically speaking, petri nets are called bipartite directed multigraphs. They are bipartite because there are two different types of nodes that we use to draw petri nets. Uh, one kind of node is called a place. Um, they are circular nodes. They are drawn as circular nodes. We may also use ovals to draw uh, places. The other kind of node is called transition. Uh, they are drawn as uh, rectangles or bar nodes. There will be arcs that will join places to transitions and transitions to places, and these arcs are directed, therefore we call them bipartite directed uh, multigraphs. Uh, the arcs can only connect places to transitions and transitions to places only, so you will not see an arc connecting two places or an arc connecting two transitions. So that's how we define uh, bipartite directed multigraphs. The reason we call them multigraphs is that we can have multiple uh, parallel uh, arcs between a place and a transition. So you may see um, in a drawing of a Petri net two arcs going from a place to a transition. Some people uh, may just put a number on an arc that captures the multiplicity or number of parallel arcs between two nodes. Here is a small trivial example of a Petri net structure, a graph. Uh, the transition T1 is drawn as a rectangular box in the middle with two places, P1 as its input place and P2 as its output place. Places uh, in Petri nets capture passive elements in a system and transitions in a Petri net capture active elements. So if you have processes, if you have uh, events, uh, they are modeled as transitions. If you have conditions, buffers, data elements, they are modeled as places. So let's look at some examples. Here we have the same structure, but now this transition represents a processor, something that processes uh, an incoming job. That incoming job comes to this processor uh, with from a, an input buffer. So we model that input buffer as an input place to this transition. And once this job is processed, it goes into an output buffer, and that output buffer is modeled as a place which is output to this uh, processor. Now, uh, if we have a job that comes into this place, we represent that with the help of a token or a black dot uh, that we place in this place. So now with this black dot placed in uh, this place which is called input buffer, what we are saying is that an, a job is available for this processor to process and we call this thing marking of a petri net. So when we place tokens in places, uh, that becomes the marking 
of this Petri-net structure. In this example, the processor has one single input buffer with a single token in it, which means that this transition is enabled. It has the uh, incoming job available to it, and the transition becomes enabled, and we show this enablement with highlighting this transition. So this transition, when it is highlighted, uh, tells us that uh, this transition is now enabled. It has the input requirements available or an incoming job in this case. And once a transition is enabled, it can fire. And a firing, uh, when it happens, uh, it removes the input token from input buffer and it deposits a token at the output place. And we see a token uh, in output buffer or place which has labeled output buffer on it. So what you just saw is a small example where we had a marking of a Petri-net with the help of a token in input buffer, which enabled this transition processor, and then this transition fired, resulting in uh, a token which was removed from input buffer and a token which was deposited in the output buffer. Another example, here we have a transition which models an event, some abstract event. It has two input conditions, so input condition one input condition 2 and once uh, this transition finds that both of these two conditions are there uh, it occurs resulting in an output condition to become true or to become valid. Now when we have these two input conditions available we model them by putting tokens in these two places which makes this transition enabled so you see this transition highlighted as a result and when this transition fires, it removes these two tokens and deposits a token in the output place, which is labeled output condition. So again, we saw an example where there were multiple input uh, places to a transition. And for this transition to become enabled, we needed tokens in all the input places. And when there was a marking which provided this, this condition or this state, to this event. This event was enabled, it took place, resulting in removal of all the tokens from the input places and uh, appearance of token at the output place. So the two tokens were removed and a single token appeared in the output condition. Now we uh, come back to our example that we looked at in part one of this lecture and we will uh, try to construct a Petri-net model, but before we uh, construct a Petri-net model, let me just remind you uh, what this system uh, does. So we have two robotic arms, A and B, and we have two uh, wafer stacks. Uh, robot A picks a wafer from a stack 1, gives it to robot B, which takes it to stack 2 and deposits uh, that wafer there. So we have a state 1 where both arms are without wafers. Uh, state 2, robot A gets a wafer from this stack, brings it to robot B. Uh, the wafer is, is exchanged and resulting in our system to switch from a state 2 to state 3. Uh, the robot B then brings this uh, wafer to the second stack and when it puts that wafer uh, on top of the second stack, the system again, again goes back to state number one. So you see this small finite state machine model of this system. Now we will con construct a Petri-net model for the same example. So here we have an event of robot uh, exchanging wafers modeled as a transition in the middle. It's a rectangular uh, node that we have drawn. And it has two input conditions, which if are there, only then this event can take place. Uh, on the left hand side we have robot A's arm with wafer so when robot A has a wafer uh, on its arm and on the right hand side we have robot B's arm without wafer so it's the state when robot A's arm is with wafer and robot B's, B's arm is waiting for a wafer only then this event can take place which says robots exchange wafer when this event takes place it results in robot A's arm without a wafer and results in robot B's arm with a wafer. 
now we again go back to the uh, place which models robot A's arm without wafer it's the state when uh, robot A can pick a new wafer so we model this activity or this event with a transition which says robot A picks wafer and when this happens robot A gets a wafer so that's how we create an arc from transition to this place on the right hand side when robot B uh, is with a wafer it can deposit that wafer to the second stack so we model that event with another transition that says robot B deposits wafer when this event takes place it results in robot B without a wafer so you see a pertinent model where the uh, state of this entire system is distributed uh, in the sense that we have different places that capture part of, 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 of that state now we uh, look at our animation of our two robots exchanging wafers picking and exchanging wafers and also see uh, our petrinet model uh, mimicking the same same states and transitions between uh, uh, those states so initially we have robot A and robot B both without uh, wafers and we capture this state by putting tokens in the corresponding places so you see a token in robot B's arm without wafer and you see another token in robot A's arm without wafer and by looking at this configuration or this marking of uh, our petrinet system we uh, can say that this is the, the initial state of our system now at this state robot A picks wafer transition is enabled so it, it fires uh, in other words our uh, system picks the wafer from stack number one and now uh, we have a situation where uh, these two robots can exchange this wafer and we see that in our petrinet model the transition which says robots exchange wafer is now enabled it has tokens in both of its input places resulting in uh, firing this transition and when this transition fires it deposits wafer uh, tokens in the output places which corresponds to the state where robot A is now without wafer and robot B has a wafer on its arm when robot B has a wafer on its arm it can deposit it and we, uh, if we look at the petrinet model we see that this transition is enabled uh, when we fire this transition we see that the system comes back to its initial state where robot A is without wafer, robot B is also without wafer. So you just uh, saw how we constructed a petrinet model at the same level of abstraction that we use to describe the system or model the system as a finite state machine and the execution of that petrinet showed us uh, different states and transitions between them. Uh, we hope uh, if you are now uh, able to do your own Petrinet models. We will uh, add a part three of the series where we will uh, do the same same model using CPN tools software.